week 10. And this is actually our last week about the theory and the concept. We've gone through a lot. The last three weeks uh, on the backend side. Okay. So before we start new content, let's recap. Right. <laughs> Always recap. So last week we learned a lot of things. First day, error handling and refactoring the code, right? Second day, what was it? I forgot. Uh, what did we learn last Tuesday? Pagination, filter, oh, yeah, no, no type stuff. <laughs> I actually don't remember. I, do you have any question about those um, exercise or homework or labs? For the whole week? Or yeah, uh, for the whole week. Uh, for this part first, error handling, refactor call, and filter pagination. No? The method you mean the uh, mongoose method? Uh, no, the way way the sim like there you can see that for errors. For or errors. Press status or just the new error. Oh. We always choose which one we use. <coughs> yeah, you can manually define the error for each um, inside each controller, right? By using try and catch block. And then you return uh, response status for some 400 and then the, the container of the error, right? So that's one way. That's you have to express. manually define it one by one in every controller. That's express, right? Because the socket is kind of different. You return the callback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. We are talking about express here. And if you want to have a con error handler, right? So you can like minimize your code. You make your code shorter by using mm -hmm. um, a higher order function to wrap everything to wrap on the uh, the function the controller mm -hmm. and then you you also have a try and cast block but you don't have it there you have it inside the the high order function which is, we call it cache acid remember so that's one way like we can like the the idea is like we create another function to reuse it in every single controller and that you actually you hardly see it in uh, some example on the internet, right? Example on the internet, they also they always you try and cast in their controller, I think. So that's for error handler. <coughs> and for that, you only do it once, and you in the next project you can copy and paste, just change the uh, the name of the variable, and that's it. For refactoring the code, you actually have something called factory, right? And it's another concept. It's a. It's not really a concept. It's a design pattern that is used a lot in Java. Okay. And on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday, <laughs> we practice uh, with React, and we also learn a new concept, which is the real-time application, the socket, web socket, right? Basically, web socket. And there are a bunch of libraries to help us um, to interact with the WebSocket. The famous, the most famous one is Socket.io. They also have a the website, very cool website, Socket.io, and you actually have a lot of uh, documentation here. It's very clear. And for the Socket.io, you can have a bunch of cool feature. For example. Um, real-time no notification for example like if you decide to create a an email platform for example you want to clone gmail you need some tool to make you um, send the email the notification <coughs> real-time right so user a send email to user b the user b if he's online he needs to see the the notification right away so in your final project you can make a clone gmail clone it's okay. It's doable. It's not. Uh, it doesn't work uh, as fast as the real one, though. But it's work. Right. So I'm gonna close this. Okay. Any question about WebSocket? It's very hard. WebSocket is actually hard. What does it sometimes say? Uh, call back is not a function. <laughs> call back is not a function. Uh, is it? Is it the the error? Yeah. So maybe because you. 
the uh, the constant that you pass from the front end to the back end is uh, it's not actually an, a function. Pass something else, you pass it data type. Actually, it's data type. You didn't pass a function, for example. Instead, you pass a string. And when inside your front end or uh, does it matter? On front end or back end, you call that callback function. You think it's a function, but actually it's not. You didn't pass a function. You pass a or when you define, you define as a it's string, an object. an object or something. Is that is it? Yeah. yeah. Shit. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, even though I call it object, uh, call it CB callback, but it's actually not a function. It's an object, a response yeah. object. Yeah, actually, it's a response object. Sorry, I, when I wrote that, it was like 2, 3 p.m. in uh, the last three months, I don't know. Right, so enough of this. I hope you enjoy this. I, I really enjoy the chat. It's new. <laughs> and actually, I had a lot of problem with the front end. <laughs> React. It's crazy. Can you actually explain one more time how, like, when we deploy, how the front end and back end work? Oh. Yeah. About that, I thought you already knew, but uh, let me make it clear, right? In your final project, or uh, uh, it's the same with uh, this chat app, you will have a, a project, a front-end project, and a back-end project, right? They have to be in different git. And you push them, the front-end you push to Netlify, and front, the back-end you push to Heroku. So you will have two different apps that works like separately. And then you can change, let me see, let me show you. You can change the URL, for example. Uh, sorry, uh, I have a bunch of folder here. My, my question is more a bit, a bit further. So when we have the front end and back end, how do we actually merge it? Like, well, no, we, we don't merge it. We don't merge them. We connect them together by using API, right? The back end is just APIs. There's a bunch of APIs, a bunch of endpoints, right? right. And the front end we call all those. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so at E call. So you have two apps, right? The front end and the back end. The back end, you will have to change the uh, the database here. So I, I actually changed it already. So instead of using the uh, DB, I change it to uh, this my app. The, uh, the cloud database is a cloud database. And also on the front end, you will have to change the local host here, change it to um, something else. For example, um, awesome chat dot app.com. And you don't need the port number here. So that's it. And inside your socket, uh, where the hell socket? Uh, here, for example, you will call a variable instead of hard code the stream. Cool. Actually, it's just like how we usually call ABI when we study React, same thing. So that's why I thought you already know this and I did and explain well, in the last. Yes, I know, yeah. I was just confused <laughs> why do we push both like to different places? Oh. And see where it comes together. Actually, right. you, can, you can deploy the front end to Heroku as well. But uh, as we as I said before, we should like deploy them in to different separate Git or separate project app. Okay. And the reason why the back end doesn't work on Netlify is that Netlify doesn't allow for server to run the server. It only allows the front end, for example, Netlify server will only serve the J the JavaScript file to the client and that's it. They, they doesn't execute any code on Netlify. But on Heroku it's more powerful, it allows you to execute the server code, right? So usually in your final project, I advise you to deploy front end on Netlify and back end on Heroku. And actually, de deploy uh, Node.js is very easy. It's super easy compared to other framework and language. So you just do git push Heroku master. That's it. Uh, I'm 
Yeah, we actually we don't push this file here to Heroku. We, as you can see, that it's right out. It's right out, right? I put it in Git. No, I actually have this because I deploy this to my own server, and on my own server, I don't have the control panel like Heroku, so I have to use terminal, and that's why I had to create the EV on my server. On Heroku, you will have a panel like this. I think you already know it. Just like the Netlify, you have a, a panel here will show you all the variables, global environment variables. Uh, so I think that's it. Right, that's clear. Now, next topic, testing you. you. Uh, right now, you may think this is unnecessary, right? But in the future, you will do this a lot. Uh, why is so ugly? Right. So why is testing? Just, just testing means like we make sure our code work, our application work, make sure it doesn't break. Right. That's it. So that's why we test. And actually, we all of us are involved in the testing process. What was that? All of us are involved in testing for the last 10 weeks. <laughs> it's manual testing. Like, we actually open our code, our Postman, our website browser, and check if everything is working, right? We open our MongoDB and check if the data is correct. All of those steps are called manual testing. So it's, it's for human checking things, and we accept or not. If something wrong, we go back and change the code, right? If it's okay, we move on. That's called manual testing. And we also have another type of test, testing called iteration. We see we test the flow between the uh, filters. So we're gonna do, for example, uh, after we create a new account, a new user, what do you expect next? Like on the front end, I expect the, the client, the user, to be directed, redirected to another route, right? So those kind of stuff are called uh, iteration, testing. And lastly, unit testing. This is the, um, the, the type of testing that we're going to learn today. I don't, I don't know why. Ah, I lost my code spoon text here. OK, unit testing. Actually, we test a some small functionality of a feature, for example, to create a user, register a user, we will do a couple of steps, and we also we need to test those steps. As well as, for example, after you create a user, what do you expect to see? What do you expect the user to see? You expect the user to receive a user object, right? And that user object contain the email that they already type, in the password. Uh, no, there's there's no password. Sorry. The email, the name, the uh, the date created, those types of, and you can actually test though without actually looking at the uh, the object. So it's it can be done automatically, and that's why we need to learn, right? Something that can be done automatically, we have to code, and that's why we have to learn. And for manually testing, we don't actually need to learn, right? Just take take a look at the database, take a look at the UI. And we can figure out what's wrong right away. Uh, uh, all right. So here, unit testing, we test a function, a small part, very small part. For example, a feature have a couple of functions. We also need to test all of those functions. Or interacting testing, we test piece together, as I said before here. So we, we test the flow. So here, we test function. Here we test the flow, different. And testing manually, there's a pro and cons. Pro is like, uh, there's a pro, see, like, we can test the app, like, all the users see, right? What, what all the people see, we also see them. 
like that. And we can spot the different, we can spot the, uh, the error right away. But there's a lot of cons here. For example, if you decide to implement a new feature, to use man to manually test is very hard because you have to repeat all those steps. For example, you have to enter username, you have to enter password, and after you create a user, you have to check the database, you have to check everything step by step. And what if you miss one step? For example, you, you enter the wrong password or you didn't check the password in the database. If the password field is missing and you don't check it, that means your test failed. And that's why you, it's very easy to forget a test because there are a bunch of steps and it's very easy to miss one of them. And if the filter is too big, you, it's very hard to test all of combination. For example, if you, you enter a wrong password or you enter an existing email or uh, your confirmed password is not correct. So there are a bunch of combinations. And if you test manually, it's very hard to do. And it takes a lot of time. For some, if you create a new user and then you decide to uh, have that user create a new tool, and then you decide that user to uh, come in on his own tool, then you have to repeat all those steps in order to test just one thing. Does review work? Creating a review work. So you have to repeat all those steps. And it's very easy to forget one of them. All right. So manual testing is not ideal. It's very good for testing the UI. It's extremely good for testing the UI. And that's why we have now, we have something called automated code testing. Basically, it's just code, a test, but not a code. Right, automatic, automated code testing. And we write code to test our own code. You can't kind of see it, but it's very fun. Right. There are rows. Bro is like it's it's very easy to repeat the steps and the steps test. For example, if you add a new feature, right, and then you are not sure if that feature breaks anything else, right? Many many of you already uh, make this mistake. For example, you add a new feature and the other feature break, broke, got broken. You didn't know until you deploy and then check your app again and you figure out oh shit. Why does it doesn't work? And you have to go back and test from the start. That's why automated testing is very important. It helps you spot all of those errors automatically. Okay. So it's kind of like it can cover a lot of core feature here and run automatically after every code change. You can just do NBM run test and that's it. You will see the result right away. But there are cons. You can only test what you define in your code, right? You have to define the test, the test first, and then you run it. It's basically just function. You define the function, you run the function, and you see the results. So that's why you have to define all of those tests beforehand in order to run them. And it's actually very hard to test the UI. If you want to test the UI, you have to look at the HTML files, and you have to target the uh, elements, and you check if that element has some string in there. It's very hard to test the UI with uh, um, unit test. So people tend to test the UI manually <laughs> somehow. And actually, uh, in previous course, we had a very simple uh, topic on testing with React. Right? We actually had it uh, last time, but um, the week was so short that we decided to skip one of them. And people were like, uh, they, they say, it's not important, so why would they want to spend a lot of time on tests? Okay. So for testing the UI, I expect you guys to test with your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to test with code. And here's a reason why we need to test. Automated tests, uh, like we can test after every code adjustment, I already said before, right? It saves a lot of times in the future. If you have a bunch of filters, uh, you can just do NDM run test with test all of the cases that you redefine. And you can actually can create a more reliable software by having the test, meaning you are sure that 
your application work. And actually, the test, your function, the test function or the test suite, it can detect the errors in some criteria that you didn't like. You don't even expect there's an error there. It's very useful, and also give the flexibility to all the developers or your coworker. This help you to check when you refactor your code. You can use the test to see if when you refactor the code, if you make any mistake, that the code will break, right? So it's very hard to test with manual, with manual test. For example, you refactor this code. Um, let me see. Uh, in the app here, you refactor. Not here. Uh, uh, sorry. Shit. Where is it? Why do you have so many stuff here? Right. For example, you refactor something in your log login handler, and then you're not sure it break anything else. That's why you need a uh, the how do you say uh, the unit testing to to make sure it doesn't break anything when you refactor your code because when you refactor your code you expect the outcome to be the same there's no change in the outcome right only to change the flow inside your, your own code it's very easy to uh, have um, collaborate with other people because before you push to GitHub you have to run the test to make sure it doesn't break any other co people code. And then you push. And actually, when you work with a public repository, for example, Facebook here. Um, GitHub. No, sorry. GitHub.com, and you uh, take a look at React. You should React, and you see Facebook React, right? There's a bunch of pull requests here. So that means people join this open shop project and they contribute their own code, right? But before they are allowed to merge, they have to uh, write their own test. And then you have to pass on the test in order to be able to be uh, like merged to the master branch. So that's why we need to test. And when you test, it, you are usually judged by the quality of your test, actually. If you write, poor test people will judge you oh, okay this guy is bad he doesn't know how to test and it's not very reliable his code isn't reliable so we decide not to merge his code so there are a bunch of reasons why you need to test uh write test uh, not this one sorry okay also it's, it's help you to, to optimize your performance as well for example if the first time you run the test, it takes 10 seconds, and then you change something in your code. The second time you run the test, it's only about 5 seconds. You mean now you know, okay, your refactoring is good, you optimize your performance a lot, like you, you cut the time to half. Okay, that's also a way to uh, optimize your performance, you, to measure your performance. So there are a bunch of reasons, and lastly, it's not really last, but um, when you write test, you actually write step by step. You don't write, uh, yeah, you usually write a test step by step. And by doing so, you can have a peace of mind. You know what you're doing next. And everything is test one by one, right? Filter A and then filter B and then filter C. You don't skip ahead from A to C. It, the test suite run one by one according to your, your how you define it. <laughs> There's some good, a bunch of theory, but here's some good video. This is how you fix your bug manually. happen to all of you <laughs> like when I debug one of you guys uh, call then I see this all right this one's wrong the other one's wrong now I fix this so I had like five er consecutive errors I fix this one another one arise I had to fix five of them 
So usually when you have a very little problem, but I have like take half an hour to fix because there are consecutive errors. All right, so make sure you write your test. <laughs> so how do we write tests? Uh, actually, it is not how we write tests. How does it work? So basically, we write function and then we execute the function. The function will execute our own code, right? And then we assert the result. We compare the results. The results that actually happen with the result that we expect. So for example, we write a function, some a with b, right? And this is what the function return. And then we will write a test. We expect some one plus shit. This is a comma, sorry. <laughs> Uh, this will be a comma. We expect sum one and two to be equal to three. Right? If it doesn't equal to three, it will return false, for example. And then that's how we test. It's very simple. Yeah. When you say something simple, actually it's hard. Why, why do you have to multiply by one then? Why can't you just say uh, three? I, I pass it into an integer or uh, number. Actually, you can do a plus b here, but what if a is a string and b is a string? It, you could concat the string together, right? So I make sure this one is a number, this one is a number. If something wrong, the whole function here will throw the error. Uh, for example, cannot multiply a string with a number, for, for example. Right, surprise. We actually have a bunch of frameworks for testing. Yay. And they, some of the most popular ones, they actually work very similar to each other. We have Jess, we have Mocha, we have Chai. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, people tend to name the framework like uh, food or drink, or like, like Google, they, they name it like snack. Uh, like uh, Pi, KitKat, something. They, they like to name the, the tools. Yeah, food. So we have uh, mocha, mocha, jazz. Okay, jazz has a lot of things. Mocha is more like uh, this tool here to run the test. Mocha will have to have uh, to run the test. And chai actually it's just an asserting assertion tool. It helps us compare the results. So jazz is more is more like framework, and these are more like library. Uh, no, you have to choose Jess, uh, Mocha, and Chai. Okay, so today we will learn Jess because it's the most popular one. If you take, uh, if you click on here, I actually link to all three repositor, three uh, repo here. There are like seven point four million download per week. Okay, for Jess and Mocha, it's just four point five million, and Chai is only three point five. So Jets is very popular. That's why we learn Jets. Okay. We also learn a new concept called uh, actually um, not we we not gonna do this in our lab, but it's good to know TDD. Uh, you may be asked to know TDD in order to join a company, right? And why is it? It's basically just test driven development. You're actually a short cycle. You define the te the code to test. You write the test before you actually code, and then you you fail the first time. The first time you run the test, you fail because you don't have any code yet. So the second time you will write some code, some very easy code to make the first test pass, right? And then you go back, you add more features, or you take a look at your own code and you refactor it. Then you run the test again to make sure it doesn't break. If it passed, you move on, you create another test, and add another feature, another test for the new feature, right? And then you code, and you test. If it fails, repeat the step. If it passed, you move on, just like that. So it's kind of like you define your user story, and then you expect what you get. You know, like, like some online like coding class, they have like the requirements, and then after you finish it, it will pass each requirement, kind of like that. Kind of like that, yes. So test driven development is more like um, you write tests in order to code, <laughs> and it's for, it's not for uh, junior or fresher to know this because wait huh, 
usually for senior, and it's actually it help them uh, to organize uh, the thought, right? So uh, if you take a look at the picture here, you write the test, you try to pass the test, then you you refactor if it good, you move on, write another test for the another feature, try to pass it. So basically, write the test for a new user story and try to pass it. If you fail, go back complete all the, the cycles and you will have an app a working app I mean and actually how does it work and what, what, what does it have it really help us to organize our thoughts so we know step by step what should we do for that feature we know step by step and you actually know where to start or where to resume and you get the right feedback right away the feedback right away for example you commit that function you don't have to read you open on your UI, enter the name, enter the password, and then hit enter, wait a couple of seconds, and then create another tool. Those kind of stuff, you don't need to do it. Just run MEM run test, and that's it. You will see the result right away. Okay. <laughs> so how to write good tests? I don't know. Actually, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's like how you code. You ask, if you ask how to write, write good code, no, I don't know how to answer that. But basically, you will learn and experience, and like you have to experience how to write tests. And then you will come up with the answer yourself. Right? But here we have a couple of tips. Tips. First, for every test, you have to name it meaningfully. For example, this test is supposed to create a success, successfully register a new account, right? So you need to name it, should register a new account. And you have another test, and that test is going to fail. It's supposed to fail. It's supposed to retrow result fail, because it's not really fail, but retrow result that cannot create a new user because of something else. So that test, should name, you should name it like, should not register a new account, for example. Because you enter a wrong email format, you, you didn't enter the password, so you support that test to not create an account. So you can also write tests like that. And the name of the test should be meaningful. And uh, this is a, a very important point here. It test, it's unit test, the test unit or it's unit test must be independent. Basically we write small functions. We write very small ones. And then we try to pass all of them, not writing a very long one and then try to pass it. Just like how we define our controller, right? we should not have everything inside one controller. Instead, we should have multiple functions that will do multiple things. And then we call them inside a function. The test is the same. We write short test, small test, right? like this. And then we try to pass them instead of having a so complicated test because people tend to go overboard and like they write some super confusing tests. Doesn't make any sense, right? The test, the purpose of testing is like to make it pass, right? To test all the cases that can break our app. It's not about how good or how complicated the, the test is. So I would rather write a very small one. And also remember to run the test before you push it to a shared repository, right? Always. For example, in your, if you work in a root project, right? Remember, your code doesn't work, and you decide to push it to GitHub. Other people clone it, and shit, it breaks. Remember that. So before you push, you need to make sure your code works, right? Oh, more of that. More about it. And here are some tips. It's not about the rules, but here are uh, another tips like you should run the uh, test before you start a coding session. Like for example, today I'm going to add this filter to my code base and I should run the test first to make sure everything works fine before I start. And then after I finish uh, today's work, I run the test again. Uh, I actually add more tests, but I basically I run the test again to make sure what I have done today is correct. Nothing break, right? So that's why you need to run the test before and after the coding session. Okay. Also, if you have a code of direct, for example, I finished the job this week and I'm gonna take a leave for three days. 
And I, I expect that when I come back, I don't remember what the hell I'm doing. So I need something like, I, I will write a test to make it fail, right, where I'm going to do next, right? I'm going to make it fail. And then when I resume, I run the test suite, and I see, oh, I failed there. And if you take the code, if you take a look at the test, you will see what you're going to do next. So here are some tips. You don't actually need to follow these, but uh, it's good practice. And also this, the name, the name of the test sh should be meaningful, and it test should be independent and short. So these are the four most important ones. And these are just some tip, personal tips. Okay, right. I talk a lot and really fast. Do you have any question about tests? It looks very simple. <laughs> uh, so just like this, the whole process of testing is just like this. Let me see. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, right. We define the test to, um, for example, when I call that ABI, I expect to see what? What I expect to see is the, we call it a result, right? And then we will assert the result to, to see if the result is what we expect or not. Is it not what we expect? So that means the test failed. That's it. Very simple. Uh, okay, any questions before we take like, do you want to have lunch today? We always have that question. <laughs> oh shit! Uh, I, I don't. I, I don't. I don't usually have that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry. I don't. I don't have lunch. Uh, but what time do you want to come back? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> uh, oh yeah. Um, hang. Hang. Actually, from the outcome, still an outcome. Actually, you have some. Uh, something to talk with a uh, couple of uh, you guys uh, because of uh, you finish the uh, the profile your profile looks very good but the other ones the, doesn't look that great so she needs to talk to some of you about your profile yeah the resume so some of you guys finish it's very good I think Daniel it's good and uh, I don't know uh, Emily is very good. <laughs> so, the resume, the the one we did in week six. Your pop, your, your portal, your profile. Right. So, uh, you're gonna use it to submit your your resume to your employer. So make sure, make it perfect. Right. And okay. So, do you have any question here? I see not. Right. We don't have to rely on our test and do it in You can. I, w I want to learn how, how you test here. Like, so if you take a look at this, I I'm being honest here. How do you write a good test? I don't actually know, really. Like people write tests differently. The end result is uh, we check if creating user work or not, right? That's the end result. So the way we write tests is will be different. He didn't teach me. <laughs> uh, for right test, it's very simple. I'm, I'm going to walk you through a, a couple of simple tests. Not really simple, but the, tool, the tools <laughs> the tools that you need to test. You, you need to know some tool in order to test. I'm going to walk you through that. And you will have to finish the whole thing on your own. Can you check our test? Yeah, of course. Just do ABM run test. <laughs> you actually you will work on uh, you keep working on your tool project that's why it's very important to finish it and then you will have another for some MBM instead of MBM run dev now we MBM run test right so well, you were saying like as an employer for like when we are creating the code we're going to judge us more on the quality of our like testing rather than the actual code. So like, both. Actually both. 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 Right. Both. But like how how are they gonna say like this is this is good testing and then this is bad testing? Oh, that's good. A good test uh, testing skill means like you read you write less code 
like lab test suite or test case, but it produced the same results. Just like how you code, right? You let you write less code, but it's easy to understand, easy easy to reuse, and it's short. That's that's kind of the opposite of what you said before. To write a lot of small functions. Yeah, you write a lot of small tests, but like they all do, like they they like uh, how do you say? You have like for example three tests versus one test. And that three tests will cover all the cases that one test does. And that three test is very small compared but to that the one test would be that would be better, right? If you would look at someone's testing skills, you, if uh, you can do the same for thing. For example, one. Mm, not like one test is actually better because when we test, we want to test all the edge cases, right? We want to test all the cases. If you only want write one function to test, how do you test all the cases? It's very hard to test all the cases with just one function. But if you write that one function down into multiple functions, and they can test all the cases for you, so that's a good test skill, right? So that's what I actually mean. It's not like, uh, so for function, you also have, uh, this function is very long, and basically we don't want to write a very long function, usually. You will see a complaint for piling. If you write a function that's longer than like 10 lines, it will complain, for example. Or your, in just inside your code, if your code has more than like uh, 30 characters or 50 characters in one line, it will complain as well. So there are a bunch of complaints when you push to a share repos. Yeah. So it's called something called ESLint. And it actually, you complain a lot about how you write your code. Actually, your code works, but the way you structure it, the way you write it, it's not really uh, ideal when you post to a share repo. <laughs> and when people see uh, ESLint complaint, they will stop looking at your code and they say, refactor it, redo it, something like that. Okay. All right. Uh, no more question, I think. And let me show you the last first, a couple of stuff. Uh, not this one. I will take a look at the score and click on my own link. Right, for testing is something I write. So the requirement today, <laughs> that's a lot. I know this one is a lot. Uh, that's a lot. But basically, I will walk you through on the basic one. We know we will know how to test in different cases. Also, this is a bonus. We also now know how to re use, redefine a promise and return a promise. Right? We are use something called a way, I see it in a way a lot. But we actually, I bet some of you guys, many of you guys don't know how to define a promise. What actually is going on behind? You just know a way, I see it. You use a see it in a way, but you don't know what the hell is going on behind a way, I so today, it's very simple. It's not, uh, it's not that uh, complicated. And uh, here's a couple of setup before we actually uh, run MBM run test. So you can do this during the break on your own. And if you have problems, uh, I will help you. Then milestone one, we will write some very simple tests. And it actually doesn't do anything in our project, but uh, this is how we uh, know how to write tests and how to run the test, and how to check it to it to see if it passed or not. Okay, Myson one is just practice. It doesn't have any to, anything to do with your project. After we finish Myson one, I'm going to delete all the code. Then uh, Myson two as well. Two is just say show you how it works in your promise. Then we are gonna delete all of the code and then we start testing with register the first feature register an account we test it then we test login and the auth middleware and that's where i will leave you <laughs> after we finish the auth middleware i'm gonna leave you and we actually have some extra stuff for testing uh, uh, email this one is harder for testing email uh, but we actually have an uh, implement that kind of feature into our app so I put it in extra stuff, so if you have time, you can take a look at it and try. Okay.
Also, you can test uploading a file. For example, you upload an, uh, an avatar for a user, and you have to make sure that avatar work. Make sure that avatar is a image, an image, and it actually inside our database. So here's how we test. So this is extra stuff. Uh, I'm not I'm not gonna gonna walk you through in the lab, but it's good to know. Okay. Okay. Now let's take a break and come back and. I don't want to wait until. All right, I'm I'm gonna walk you through one and two first. So let's take five minute break. All right. <laughs> it's not that much, but uh, five minute break. <laughs>